Then they are unfortunately up contest. And
And of course, the uh, first to get together was the next year in 1854. Thirteen. What are some physical symptoms of anxiety? Uh, whether it's sweat, sweating, uh, racing heart, shortness of breath, having problems with sleep or memory, getting headaches or feeling sick to your stomach, or all of the above. All of the above. Well, yeah, exactly. Panic attacks are a make believe, something people make make up to stay home from work, an anxiety related problem, where the person gets an intense feeling of doom. C and D together. You're right. Okay, flip your sheet, and there's a few more questions. Uh, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, is a type of anxiety disorder. What are some common examples? A, a fear of perfume. Uh, B, a fear of dirt and germs, like an over-the-top fear. Uh, C, being obsessed about order and tidiness. 
And uh, is it B and C together? Right. D. It's D. You're right. D is in the doctor. Number 16, people with depression, bipolar or psychosis, are A, unlucky people, B, have low intelligence, C, have a medical problem, or D, C, C, C. Number 17, after this presentation, you wonder whether or not you may have a mental health problem such as depression. You decide to A, say nothing about it, it'll just go away, or B, keep it a secret because others will judge you, C, arrange to see your physician about it, D, talk to your pastor about it. E, both C and D. E. 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 C and C. E. C. 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 Well, no. sometimes C is really good, but if it uh, if you need to deal with spiritual e. issues, e. that's yeah. why E is even better. E. Okay. Number 18, mental illness may be caused by A, a chemical imbalance in the brain, B, a stressful situation at home or at work, C, physical and or emotional abuse, D, for no apparent reason, E, uh, your genes, your hereditary, F, any or all, any or all, you're right, F is the answer for that one. Let's go back, let's go back to number one, that question that has to do with stigma. And um, I'd like to go over quickly some of the uh, aspects of stigma. And uh, it is so prevalent in, uh, in so many ways, it just seems like a mountain of a problem for those who, who are dealing with mental illness. And yet we know that our God is a great God and that he is able and, uh, and that he will be able to help us. Uh, employment, Naturally, if you are diagnosed with a mental illness, you may have to go on sick leave, a leave of absence, and you may or may not be re rehired by your employer because that employer may get skittish about rehiring you. Uh, the question of housing, if you're on a disability pension or social assistance, housing is always a big question. Is it going to be safe? Is it going to be supportive? Or are you going to end up in a uh, kind of almost like a dump that's going to be very hard to live in? It affects relationships because sometimes families are not sympathetic to a family member who develops a mental illness. They may become the scapegoat in the family, which leaves them feeling very lonely. Uh, again, uh, friends, they may or may not understand if, you, uh, if a person develops a mental illness. And that is, again, a very isolating thing. Part of the stigma that we have is that there's no expectation for recovery. <coughs> and that is, uh, if someone has cancer, and I go visit a person in hospital who has cancer, I will not say to him or her, well, it's too bad, there's no hope for your recovery. You know, that would be quite out of line. And yet the general perception with mental illness is that there is no recovery. And we need to change that uh, attitude and idea. Because of stigma, many people do not seek help. And of course, the illness progresses until finally there's a crisis. And finally, they do seek help. But it would have been better if they had gotten help earlier. They also try to medicate themselves because they keep it a secret. And what is the one, th one thing they use to medicate themselves? Drugs and and alcohol. Yeah. Uh, there's a great deal of um, just plain ignorance concerning various mental illnesses, and some people can uh, confuse it with uh, mental retardation, which of course is also a very serious concern, but it's a different issue. Again, public perceptions. Uh, when you look at the movies, what is w the one characteristic that's really promoted about mental illness in the movies? Dangerous. That they're dangerous offenders, that they're violent, 
And um, the fact is that the uh, extent of violence among mental health consumers is no different from the general population. It's approximately the same. However, there is a statistic that shows mental health consumers are more likely to be victims of violence than the average um, general population. Can we interrupt any time? Just at the very end here. Okay. Uh, another aspect of stigma is the fact that even though we've just pointed out that one in five Canadians will have a mental illness at some point in their lifetime, it only gets a very small part of the budget for health care in Canada, whether it's the services for mental health or whether it's research into mental health, it only gets a very small part of the pie. And of course, stigma leads to silence. And if there is a mental illness in the family, if it's a parent, sometimes the children have questions and fears that go unanswered because nobody is talking about it within the family. Okay, questions? Okay. A year. You know, when, when the years pass, do you sort of set personal goals for yourself? Now, what's one of the goals most of us set at the end of every year, in the beginning of the new year? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we do. We do. That's normally what we do. We set a goal. Well, you know what? I'm going to take off that weight. Or maybe a goal is I'm going to start to attend uh, midweek Bible service or prayer service. We set goals, but normally what happens sometimes when we set these goals, they're good for about a couple of days and then we're right back to our goals. But once we have an idea of why we exist, which is the mission, and where we want to go, which is the vision, then we need to determine how we're going to get there. So it's not enough to say, for example, I want to lose weight. You just can't say it and then it will happen. You have to say, well, how am I going to do it? Am I going to change my eating habits? Am I going to exercise? Am I going to do a combination of both? Am I going to go get an operation? Like, how are you going to do it, okay? We get there by developing what we call goals, which are specific tasks that we need to undertake in order to achieve our mission and vision. You know what? Here's an example of a goal for a church. A goal for a church may be to grow your, your church membership. Let's say you've got 150 members. So the goal may be to grow your church membership by, say, 6%, or nine new members. Therefore, in keeping with this goal, when you prepare and you start talking about how we're going to reach it, and you start preparing the budget, you have to pass this information along so that resources are made available to assist in accomplishing the goal. If you set a goal, you can't keep it to yourself. Somebody needs to know what your goal is because you know what? That's going to support you and that's going to help you. So if you make that decision, if you set that goal that, hey, I'm going to lose weight, tell somebody because then they'll help you. You can't sort of keep it to yourself. Okay? Information on goals that have, for example, in this case, any financial implications need to be communicated to your church body, whether the finance committee or whatever, to ensure that adequate funds are allocated to support the goal in preparing the church budget. In this example, when we said you want to go to church, grow the church membership by, say, 6%, or we want to gain nine new members, well, we may say, how are we going to do it? Maybe we're going to work on some type of new outreach program. So as part of the outreach program, maybe we're going to have to look at preparing some really nice brochures. It's going to cost to prepare them that we can take door to door. Or maybe what we're going to have to do in order to, I guess, invite new members into our church is to look at some fellowship hours whereby people can start inviting people in. So those things need to be communicated because you know why? There's a dollar sign attached to them. You need money in order to do them. Well, I talked about what a mission was, a vision, a goal, they're all linked together. The final part of that is sort of really what we're going to sort of concentrate on for a little while here is a budget. Can someone here, in real simple terms, 
tell me what is what a budget is in real simple terms? It's more, okay, it's how you're going to spend your money, but how you're going to get it. Okay, how are you going to get it, how are you going to spend it. Yes, Al? Thousand 
thousand dollars, say you have a thousand dollars in your credit card every year, you know your your interest on that alone at say thirty percent is three hundred dollars. That's kind of ridiculous, isn't it? But yet we do need credit because it's not like you're going to have one hundred fifty two hundred three hundred thousand dollars to go there buy a house. Because I don't know how, too, how many people have that kind of capital able to say that. So I'm not knocking credit, but we need to be good stewards, even of credit cards, because they can get you in trouble. Sometimes, you know, how you're in the store and somebody is in front of you and they, you know, they give the debit card, they give this debit card, it's like, uh-uh. Then they give another yeah. one, uh-uh. And now people don't even care. Like before, you know, you get embarrassed and said, oh, yeah. you know, somebody, now they just hand over another one. Yeah. One guy that was in front of me one time uh, was at the bay, you know what he said to the, uh, uh, the teller, he simply said, I'll just keep on giving you cards to one another one. That's when you ask the question. They see that they can do whatever they want, and the church will not step up. The Maoris can come into our communities, take our children away, no one steps up. If we don't speak, if the children, our youth, do not see us, we'll lose them. Now, I want to tell you that this is an old question to me. I dealt with it for over 30 years. And when I brought the truth to them, the church didn't listen. No one listened. I'll give you an example. Back 20 years ago, Kohara High, we're looking at one of the vice principals. We had that explosion. Ah, my people said, and the leader said, it's racism. I said, it is drugs and pimping and racism. We went with racism, we got money. But no one's dying today because of racism. They're dying because of the drugs and the other criminal acts which are going on. And you know all about them. Now, what we really need to do, we need to step up and show our young people that we care for them. We need organizations in each of our churches, each a little different, which will work in the community with the secular world for preventive action. We can pray, yes, but until we realize and show our young people that we care for them, they're not going to listen to us. Now we can pray, and our young people, you see they're not in our churches today, they say, keep on praying. But we need to show them that we care for them. We need to reach out. Now the last thing I want to say is this. How does our black leaders, you tell our black families and our churches that it's the system that's wrong. Explain to me, I used to say to them, how come these people can come with their families and can't read and their children need our classes by the time they get to grade 12 and take all the prizes and where are our kids? The thing is, it's in the home. Now, you don't have to believe me the last thing I say. You go to the colleges that we have here today. You look for the indigenous black child. For the number we have, it's few. But you look at all the races that come here. Africans, all of them. You look at those universities, and by percentages, they have all kinds of minorities in there. But where are our children? We need to have what you call Voluntary organizations that deal with drugs, that deals with education. Now, don't not tell me one last thing. The last thing. The last thing is this. We say all. Oh. Kind of wrap up, folks. All right. This is fun. Can we keep them a little short because we're running a little late? Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as uh, Reverend Sherilyn Beals said, it's a wonderful dialogue, and we thank you for bringing it to us. It's time for us to just simply talk because our children are hurting. It's not just our children, we're hurting. We're all in pain. If something happens to one child in our community, it affects every one of us. So we have to realize that whether we want to or not, they're all our children. You know, they're all our children. And if I, I mean, we're all in pain because we're, we're God's children. Um, Lynn was saying sometimes the men are afraid to come into the community because they think it's dangerous, but it's us. We're, we're from this community. 
These are our children, these are our people, these are our families. I tell my kids, my father was from 18, and my mom's from Hams Plains in Lucasville, and, and I tell them, you don't talk about anybody, because you'll find out later on, these are one of your relatives. We're all related. Whether we like it or not, you said it. It's not the Simmonses, it's the Simonses. It's not the Gordons, it's the Gordons. Jordans. I mean, we, when the Dowdies changed their name from B O W N E Y to D O W N I E. We're still related. We're still the same family. And so we have to realize that our families are in pain. And so now, with God's help, as we draw closer to God, because a lot of times we don't go to God unless we're dying or somebody's sick, but we have to get on our knees every day. Just ask God to protect us put his Holy Spirit around us, show us his favor, and pray for one another. Just keep praying. But for, for this uh, forum this afternoon, I'd love to go away with just a few suggestions of what we can do. And, and our, you know, our, our communities are, we, we never seen this before in the Preston areas. We don't even know what to do. We, we don't even know Preston or Halifax. Or we, we don't even know what to do, but we have to admit that. We do not know what to do, but we're willing to come together and do something. And I think that whatever committee or group we put together, we should never make it like that just that group, just that committee is, is, is in charge or, or responsible, because then you're gonna, you're, gonna, you're gonna scare everybody. We're all responsible. Brian, he's not quite as old as he is, but we came up during that time and we were making <laughs> We were all mentored through the BYF. That was our mentoring. Yeah. That's where we got our leadership skills. I'm always clear to say that. And I'm very disappointed in the years now where I feel that you know the youth have not been from that experience. <coughs> um, quickly, I'm a mother of three boys, and I am still um, working with a 28-year-old to keep them under the system and keep them on the straight and narrow. I have two that are you know doing their thing, but you know as a mother, love is unconditional. You never give up and you never stop working. And just to change our attitudes about who we young men are and what they should be. Because I remember, you know, having a heart to heart with him. I'll call it a heart to heart. I won't tell you what it was because I was really living with him and having a conversation. It was like, um, you know, about who he was. And he said, you know, I need to get respect. And what they perceive that respect is and how they perceive they're going to get it. And as a mother, I didn't let go of that. But men, when you're talking young men, uh, you know, don't tell me you're a man, do what you want to do, because that kind of feeds into the whole stereotypical thing. My last point is, I mean, I make a personal commitment to whatever is, uh, whatever strategies are developed, whatever committees, I want to be a part of that, because I really think we're losing generations, we're losing kids, we're left, right, and center, and it's just breaking my heart. And I thank God every day that, as I said, my son's a little bit trouble, but I work with him every day, and it's something that he now understands that he has to do himself, yeah. but with the support of the community. And I love it when he comes back and says, I saw so-and-so, they told me I wasn't supposed to be down here. And I, for me, that just warms my heart, but we really need to get a hold of the rest of our youth. Thank you. The disease which is in the community should be routed out first. We have the drug, we have human rights in the homes. Then we have the negligence of parents and the lack of responsibilities of some parents. Well, it is clear that we were given at the beginning, Jeremiah 33 verse 3, call to me and I'll answer you. This means that there is lack of prayer in some homes. Education starts at home. It can't start as a church. So parents have to bring their children here in order these children to be handled by the church. Not all, all of those who were in the, in the way where Jesus was passing were healed, except those who were calling on Jesus. The association has nothing to do when the child is not brought to church. But we will suggest that uh, as uh, uh, the other speaker said, working through uh, different uh, individual churches, but we need a board, a, a, a supervising board in the, in the, in the association.
to supervise and see how to spearhead these uh, activities. Uh, these are some of the, the things I want. Thank you for just a minute to say something. I really don't know where to begin, but I have worked with young people since I was 14 years old. And um, one thing I noticed all my life is the fact that when I was brought up in my home and my community, there were rules and regulations. And I think that young people looking for rules and regulations in families, you know, sometimes young people do something and people say, oh, that's all right, that's all right. But if they don't have the guidelines, they don't know what's right and what's wrong. And uh, that's one thing. We should, we should set guidelines. Another thing is accomplishments. If we want something to happen, we should be willing to work with our young people and help them to accomplish something. If they do something in their community, in their home, or whatever the case may be, whether it's, it's a game, whether they're uh, raising money for something, and they, they can see, we have done this as a group. They feel proud of it. And I think that in all of this, if we try to organize our young people, show them some accomplishment, and help them to work towards uh, achieving those things. Now, I started to say uh, earlier about young people, because I've taught young people all my life, that there is more power in young people than all of us say here. Young people determine what furniture you buy in your house, what food you buy, where you go, how you spend your money, and everything else. In the community of Cherry Grove, when we had debt, our organization, our young people, right in front of them, and Tracy's another one, and Shirley's another one, we organized the young people, and they raised thousands of dollars to pay for a building. And in two years, that building was paid for. The young people organized themselves. I'm telling you, Young people can do a lot of things. They just need to be challenged, and they need to be um, uh, supervised by someone who cares. I want to speak of the days in Buck when we were able to go to the supervisor of schools and ask if we could have a worker to work with the special services teachers. And I tell you, I found a lot. A lot, of, a lot of it was blamed on the children. When the children, teachers were having problems themselves, they take it up on overactive children. And we found that out. Another thing we found out that children were, uh, others were saying, oh, that teacher did this, and I did that with the children. I go to the home, get the mother to put her coat on, and come down to the school with me. And she'd see her children with a hat coat sitting in the hall re uh, doing the lessons because they haven't done it, you know? So we have to be responsible for what's going on in our community and speak the truth. Thank you. So just to, to, just to summarize, um, we have one passing your own question as a rhetorical question. And then, thank you. I was hoping that the congregation would uh, respond to the question. But briefly, I think maybe three things. I think that one reason why we have not responded is that um, in light of the church, I think our position is being served by secular organizations. And so if we can allow, um, say for example, the boys and girls come to speak to the issue of church to the issue. I also think that, um, that we are afraid of repercussions in terms of our community. Uh, we make all kinds of excuses. We say we love our young people. We want the, what's best for them. We want to work with them. But the church will not take the bull by the horn and step out in faith. It's afraid of what would happen to them and they address the issue at the local community level. Uh, I think the final comment in terms of why we have not uh, responded is 
in terms of how we see ourselves as black people. I think that um, there's, there's all kinds of resources there to help us with our issue. And I think that there's some organization that are secular that uh, will see that and will run for the money and take ownership of it at the expense of excluding the church and others. So I, I think that those in my mind, in my humble opinion, is the why we have yet to address the issue as a church. Thank you. Uh, and, and if they want us to work with them, it's not a matter of us just going and wanting to do. They have to want us to help them, right? Especially some of the older young people. The younger ones, yes, we do have to intercede. But there are some times that we have to ask them first. Don't go say, you should do this, you should do that, you should do that. That doesn't work with young people. They need to tell you what they want. And then you have a dialogue, and you have to ask them if they want our help. That's what I feel. We've actually come to an exact hour. Sorry. Deal with these problems. We have never called upon them. We have never used them. That's what we need to do. And my services are always, always available to any church, any community, any family that wants to sit down and have this dialogue. Thank you, everyone, and again. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun, at the trumpet call, lift your voice, it's a year to be.